Now celebrating our 22nd year of service to the worldwide amateur radio community, we are This Week in Amateur Radio, your all-amateur radio and technology news magazine and bulletin service of the air. This is edition number 1176 with a release and air date of Saturday, September 11th, 2021. Please take the program to your air following the Q-Tone. Coming up on our 23rd year of service to the amateur radio community around the world, we are This Week in Amateur Radio, North America's premier amateur radio and technology news magazine and bulletin service of the air. Here are the stories for release around the earth as we come to air with edition number 1176 of This Week in Amateur Radio. The 20th anniversary of 9-11 is celebrated by amateur radio operators and the AWRL. The Genesis amateur radio satellites are among the payloads lost in a dramatic launch failure. The AWRL Board of Directors meets to bestow awards on amateur radio's best. The August 2021 Volunteer Monitor Program has been released. We will tell you who has been bad and who has been good on the amateur bands. The FCC extends the filing deadlines for affected Louisiana parishes and Mississippi counties. Louisiana Aries operations are finally returning to normal status following Hurricane Ida. A California club assists with a large and small animal rescue group with communication support in the California wildfires. The VOIP net will be activating this weekend for Hurricane Larry. And a unique amateur radio special event will be taking place in Switzerland from Hot Air Balloons. We will have all the details on how you can work this one coming up in this week's report. These headline stories will come to you in a moment along with this week's special features. We'll visit with Bruce Page, KK5DO, and get an update from AMSAT and what's new with all of those amateur satellites in orbit. Our technology reporter, Leo Laporte, W6TWT, will talk about ads in Windows 11. Some IT exploitations were on the net on Labor Day. Apple delays the scheduled scanning of iPhones. And eight states will allow you to store your driver's license on your phone. Leo will also tell us about the brand new Bluetooth wireless codec that is claimed to rival a wired connection and he will tell us about the sudden shutdown of the local channel retransmission streaming service, Locast. Australia's own Anno Benshoff, VK6FLAB, will answer the question, what is in a sound? Our own amateur radio historian, Bill Continelli, W2XOI, returns with another edition of the Ancient Amateur Archives. This week, Bill takes us back to 9-11. Bill was in New York City on that day, and he will tell us about his experience being only a few blocks away from the World Trade Center. Our tower climbing and antenna master, Greg Stoddard, KF9MP, will talk about rules you should follow when you are climbing with and for other amateurs. That's all straight ahead as North America's premier amateur radio and technology news magazine and bulletin service, This Week in Amateur Radio, takes to the air right now. Reporting from Studio A here at our headquarters facility in beautiful downtown Albany, New York, I'm George, W2XBS. And reporting from our news bureau in the sleepy little town of Cortlandville, New York, right in the heart of central New York, I'm Chris Perrine, KB2FAF. And reporting from the newsroom in Half Moon, New York, I'm Terry Saunders, N1KIN. And reporting from our amateur radio station atop the Catskill Mountains in upstate New York, where the autumn leaves have just begun to fall. But the pumpkins are certainly turning orange. I'm Don Hewlett, K2ATJ. And from Studio One of our Central Florida News Bureau, I'm Fred, November Fox 2 Fox. And reporting from our Troy, New York News Bureau, where it's almost time for apple picking, I'm Eric, KD2RJX. And now with our lead story, here is Chris Perrine, KB2FAF. Leading off this week's news, the AWRL, the National Association for Amateur Radio, honors the memories of those who died in the terrorist attacks of September 11, 2001, at the World Trade Center, the Pentagon, and in Shanksville, Pennsylvania, including these radio amateurs. Stephen A. Jacobson, N2SJ53 of New York City, who died at the World Trade Center. 
William V. Steckman, WA2ACW, 56, of West Hempstead, New York, who died at the World Trade Center. Michael G. Jacobs, AA1GO, 54, an ARRL member from Danbury, Connecticut, who died at the World Trade Center. Lieutenant Robert D. Seary, Sr., KA2OTD, 39, an ARRL member from Nutley, New Jersey, and Port Authority police officer who was helping to evacuate workers from the building when it collapsed. William R. Ruth, W3HRD, 57, of Mount Airy, Maryland, who died at the Pentagon. Gerald J. Rod Coppola, KA2KET, 46, of New York City, who died at the World Trade Center. And Winston A. Grant, KA2DRF, 59, of West Hempstead, New York, who died at the World Trade Center. An assembly of articles, stories, and messages from the November 2001 issue of QST Magazine is available at the ARRL website. Several special events will commemorate the attacks of September 11, 2001 and honor the victims. Saturday, September 11, from 1200 to 2359 UTC, the Somerset County Amateur Radio Club and Nittany Amateur Radio Club will activate N3M. Frequencies will be 14.293, 7.293, and 3.993 MHz. QSL, care of Nittany Amateur Radio Club, P.O. Box 614, State College, Pennsylvania, 16801. Saturday, September 11th, from 1400 to 1900 UTC, the Harrisburg, Pennsylvania Radio Amateur Club will operate W3M. Frequencies are 7.265 and 14.265 MHz. For a certificate, visit www.w3uu.org slash W3MQSL. Saturday, September 11th, 1200 UTC to 2400 UTC, the Pentagon Amateur Radio Club will sponsor Special Event Station K4P. Operation will be in the general class portions of 80, 40, 20, 15, and 10 meters on CW and RIDI. There will be a special QSL card available via PARC at P.O. Box 2322, Arlington, Virginia, 22202. For more information, contact Gary Seasums, KC5QCN. Saturday, September 11th, from 1400 UTC to 2400 UTC, members of the Great South Bay Amateur Radio Club and the Northwest Wireless Radio Club will activate special event call sign W2T. Through September 13th, from 1600 to 0200 UTC, members of the American Legion Post 10 Amateur Radio Club, Albany, Oregon, will activate as N7F. QSL with a self-addressed stamped envelope to American Legion Post 10, 1215 Pacific Boulevard, Southeast, Albany, Oregon, 97321. Email for more information. Through September 13th, the Wireless Association of New York City, Staten Island, will activate WA2NYC. Frequencies will be 28.450, 21.350, 14.340, and 7.238 MHz. D-Star Reflector XLX020B will be monitored at the top of the hour. QSL to Wireless Association of New York City, 233 Wolverine Street, Staten Island, New York, 10306. Email for more information. Through September 14th, N3U will be on the air from Pennsylvania to remember all victims of 9-11. QSL via W3PN. Operation will be mostly on single sideband and CW with some digital activity. Search the special events calendar on the ARRL website for more details on these operations. The Genesis L and Genesis N ham radio satellites were among several carrying amateur radio payloads lost following the failure of the Firefly Alpha rocket during its first launch on September 2nd from the Vandenberg Space Force Base in California. With more on this story, we go to Steve Richards, Golf 4 Hotel Papa Echo, who files this report through the facilities of the Southgate Amateur Radio News. An anomaly occurred about two minutes into the mission, causing controllers to destroy the launcher in flight. The anomaly has not yet been explained. 
This was sad news for AMSAT EA in Spain, as Genesis L and Genesis N were the first satellites they'd built themselves. According to the AMSAT EA website, the Genesis satellites were destroyed after the Firefly Alpha vehicle presented an anomaly as it hit a velocity of Mach 1 and reached Max Q, a point of maximum aerodynamic pressure on the vehicle. The launch had been halted a few seconds before takeoff, but the countdown was subsequently resumed. Genesis L and Genesis N were to conduct a series of telecommunications related experiments, while a ground station analysis of the received signals would try to attain Doppler variations in order to perform orbit determination and satellite identification from amateur radio stations around the world. Also lost in the launch failure were the Serenity, Hilapo, the Crest Dream Comet, Cubic 1 and Cubic 2 satellites, and Spinnaker 3 Firefly Capsule 1. All were designed to use amateur radio frequencies for telemetry and or communication. Serenity, a 3U CubeSat, was developed by a group called Teachers in Space to provide a low-cost opportunity to test educational experiments in space. TIS has previously guided high schools and other academic institutions in developing and flying suborbital experiments using high-altitude balloons, stratospheric gliders and rockets. This was to be their first orbital satellite mission. Serenity carried a suite of data sensors and a camera to send data back to Earth using amateur frequencies. Hilapo was an educational 1U CubeSat developed by the Hawaii Science and Technology Museum. The Hilapo project was intended to provide hands-on support for the science, technology, engineering and mathematics curriculum for Hawaii students in grades K to 12. Part of this curriculum involved obtaining data about solar flares, solar particle events and disturbances in Earth's magnetic field. Data would be available for amateur radio operators to download directly from the satellite. The Crest Dream Comet was a 3U CubeSat developed by the University of Cambridge as a small satellite for technology demonstrations. Cubic 1 and Cubic 2 were PICO satellites developed by the Libra Space Foundation, a non-profit association developing Pocket Cube PICO satellite technology. They were built following the 1P Pocket Cube form factor. The mission of these satellites was similar to that of Genesis L and Genesis N. Spinnaker 3 was a collaboration between the Cal Poly CubeSat Laboratory, Purdue University and NASA. It was designed to provide rapid de-orbit capability for the second stage of Firefly Alpha's launch vehicle, using frequency shift keying on the 70cm amateur band for communications. Firefly Capsule 1 consisted of non-technical items from around the world, including photos, artwork and books. The two digital repeater satellites were among several on board the rocket built by Texas-based Firefly Aerospace. Firefly tweeted, Alpha experienced an anomaly during first stage ascent that resulted in the loss of the vehicle. The company was previously known as Firefly Space Systems before entering bankruptcy, which had emerged from in 2017 with new owners. The ARL board granted several awards at its July 2021 meeting. The ARRL Doug DeMaw, W1FB Technical Excellent Award, went to Steve Frank, K9AN, Bill Somerville, G4WJS, and Joe Taylor, K1JT, for their July and August 2020 QEX article, the FT4, and the FT8 Communications Protocol. The DeMaw Award honors the author of an article or article series judged to possess the highest degree of technical merit in ARRL periodicals for the past year. John Level, W8KIW of Hillsboro, Ohio, was designated as the recipient of the 2021 ARRL Philip J. McGann Memorial Silver Antenna Award. This award honors a public information officer who successfully promotes all aspects of amateur radio that enhance the understanding of its contributions to education, public safety, and recreation. The board said Laveau's efforts over time have captured many of the avenues of opportunities of amateur radio as a hobby, an education tool, and a service for public safety. The 2021 ARRL Technical Service Award 2021 award recipient is James Baxter, K0UA of Branson, Missouri. The board said Baxter exemplifies the spirit of this award due to his diligent work assisting hundreds of hams get on the air 
particularly with FT8, and by spending countless hours on web sessions with them to work out their configuration issues, show them the best practices, and to help track down RFI issues. The board bestowed the 2021 Technical Innovation Award to Steve Haynell, KF70, Wojciech Kamarowski, SP5WWP, and Roger Clark, VK3KYY. Haynell was cited as instrumental and driving force behind the Hermes Light 5 watt HF SDR transceiver, as well as an open full source hardware and software project. Kazmarski was recognized for developing the open source digital radio communications protocol M17, leading to the development of Droid Star, an Android application by Doug McLean, AD8DP. Clark was cited for spearheading a successful effort to augment a low cost handheld radio for use by visually impaired operators, significantly lowering the cost of entry for such operators. The 2021 Herbert S. Breyer Instructor of the Year Award went to David Ritter, ND4MR. ARRL sponsors this award in conjunction with the Lake County, Indiana Amateur Radio Club in Breyer's memory to recognize superior amateur radio instruction and recruitment. An ARRL member for nearly 40 years, Ritter is an ARRL registered instructor and a full-time faculty member at Wilkes Community College in North Wilkesboro, North Carolina, where he's the lead and sole technician licensing course instructor since 2010. The Volunteer Monitor Program is a joint initiative between the ARRL and the Federal Communications Commission to enhance compliance in the amateur radio service. This is the Volunteer Monitor Program Report for August 2021. Licensees in Pawkatuck, Connecticut, Wamego, Kansas, Valley Cottage, New York, Long Valley, New Jersey, Columbia, South Carolina, and Maryville, Tennessee were sent advisory notices concerning operations on frequencies that were set aside for Haiti Earthquake Emergency Communications by the International Amateur Radio Union Region 2 Emergency Coordinator. Licensees in Prineville, Winston, Silver Lake, and Roseburg, Oregon, Sioux Falls, South Dakota, and Houston, Texas, were sent advisory notices concerning failure to identify, as required by Section 97.119, Subpart A of the FCC's Amateur Radio Service Regulations, pursuant to a nationwide rule compliance review of operations on 3.819 MHz and 3.953 MHz. A former licensee in Seabrook, Texas, was sent an advisory notice concerning operations with an expired license. An FT8 operator in Orion, Michigan was sent an advisory notice reminding him of the 200 watt power limit on 30 meters. A licensee in New Caney, Texas, was sent a final notice that his case was being referred to the FCC for license revocation or deletion of voice privileges from his license. A good operator accommodation was sent to an operator in Roseville, California for exemplary amateur procedure on May 21st of 2021 during the 40 meter California Rescue Communications Net. The revised totals for monitoring in July was 5,746 hours, the highest number of hours monitored since the inception of the Volunteer Monitor Program. The IT staff at the ARRL headquarters completed work on an automated system for volunteer monitors to report monthly monitoring hours and incident reports. We thank Riley Hollingsworth, K4ZDH, Volunteer Monitor Program Administrator, for this month's report. In the wake of the disruption caused after Hurricane Ida struck the Gulf Coast of the U.S. as a Category 4 storm on Sunday, August 29th, the FCC has announced that it is extending certain filing deadlines for those in Louisiana and Mississippi unable to meet them due to the storm. President Joseph Biden issued an emergency declaration for Mississippi on August 28th and a major disaster declaration for Louisiana on August 29th. Pursuant to its authority to waive rules for good cause and to alleviate any additional burden that may be caused by FCC filing requirements and regulatory deadlines, the FCC has extended certain deadlines occurring August 29th to September 30th, 2021, inclusive, for affected licensees and applicants in the affected areas. 
The FCC is defining affected areas as the Louisiana parishes and Mississippi counties that the Federal Emergency Management Agency has designated as eligible for individual or public assistance for the purposes of federal disaster relief as of Friday, September 3rd, which includes all parishes and counties in those states. The deadline extension does not apply to individuals living elsewhere in the United States. For affected licensees and applicants in Louisiana and Mississippi, the FCC has extended until October 1st any deadlines currently set within the period August 29th to September 30th, 2021 inclusive with respect to wireless radio service applications, notifications, and reports pursuant to Parts 1, Subpart F only, 13, 20, 22, 24, 27, 30, 74, excluding Subparts G and L, 80, 87, 90, 95, 96, 97, or 101, of the Commissioner's rules, including, but not limited to, filings regarding certain minor license modifications, license renewals, and notifications of construction. Licensees and applicants making delayed filings in accordance with its extension must include with those filings a certification made under penalty of perjury that the deadlines could not be met within the time otherwise provided in the Commission's rules because of Hurricane Ida. Louisiana Aries Section Emergency Coordinator James Coleman AI-5B said this week that amateur radio emergency service terms in his section should now be on normal status with the affected parishes status as appropriate for local conditions. With more on this story, we go to Steve Richards, Gulf 4 Hotel Papa Echo, who files this report through the facilities of the Southgate Amateur Radio News. Emergency coordinators in some hard-hit parishes had activated volunteers for relief and recovery operations. More than 30 parishes were affected by the storm, although cell telephone outages in the affected areas stood at 3.7% as of September the 8th and recovering rapidly. All 911 systems were reported operational as of September the 8th. In his report, AI5 Bravo said that the Louisiana Aries Emergency Net was now on standby, but if it becomes necessary, the net will be active from 2 p.m. to 6 p.m. U.S. Central Time on 7.255 MHz and from 6 p.m. to 10 p.m. on 3.878 MHz. The Louisiana Traffic Net is operating seven days a week at 6 p.m. on 3.910 MHz. ARRL headquarters shipped ham radio aid kits to Louisiana Region 3 for use during their recovery efforts. Region 3 District Emergency Coordinator Miriam Barrett, Kilo Golf 5 Bravo November Hotel, and St. Mary's Parish Emergency Coordinator Jackie Price, Kilo Alpha 5 Lima Mike Zulu, have coordinated their efforts to assist the Council on Aging in Terrebonne Parish. The handmade kits contain equipment for HF, VHF and UHF, including handheld transceivers and base station antennas. The Whiskey 5 Romeo Alpha Romeo VHF repeater on 146.805 MHz was in use over a four-parish area, La Forche, St. Charles, St. John and Terrebonne, which suffered significant wireless systems damage as well as a 911 system outage in St. John Parish. The St. Charles Emergency Operations Centre was transmitting requests via the LWARN 440 MHz linked repeater system. A communications team in support of Florida Baptist Disaster Relief established operations in a communications trailer at the Meteri Baptist Church. The Jefferson Parish Emergency Operations Centre and the City of Kenner EOC assisted by maintaining a VHF net. Unfortunately, the Kenner EOC fiber optic cable that provided internet was cut by Entergy so it could access one of its lines for repair. That left two erratic cell phones and a VHF net as the only communications Kenner had with Jefferson Parish. Operators had to climb onto the roof of the EOC to pick up the two meter antenna that had been knocked down by the wind. Gordon Gibby, Kilo X-Ray 4 Zulu, reported that Materi was hard hit with power outages and boil water notices, although the areas around hospitals have now had power restored. KX4Z said that hams can be a big benefit by partnering with organisations like Florida Baptist and working to meet their specific communications needs. He said that hams were somewhat embedded within the volunteer organisation. A report from Tangi Pahoa Parish said that as weather conditions deteriorated on August the 29th, the day Hurricane Ida made landfall, local repeaters lost power and went on to battery backup. Two repeaters were lost when a tower collapsed. 
formal weather nets were not conducted to conserve power for emergency transmissions only. As of September the 6th, both the WB5NET and W5TEO repeaters remained on battery backup and are conserving power. Elmer Tatum, November 5 Echo Kilo Fox, reports that, as of September the 8th, all of the repeaters in Ascension Paris Region 2 remain off the air, and two of them sustained damage. Two radio amateurs at the State Emergency Operations Centre staffed the centre for some 20 hours straight. Tatum relieved them on Monday, August the 30th, and passed quite a few messages, including one request for an ambulance. Some parish emergency operations centres passed traffic via VHF Simplex. Harry's Region 2 Assistant Director Emergency Coordinator Michael Nolan, KD5 MLD, reported that Region 4 objectives were accomplished during the storm. All involved major challenges. These including establishing amateur radio communications with the State Emergency Operations Center, Region 2 Emergency Operations Center, and the American Red Cross, requesting implementation of auxiliary communication rapid response teams to assist served agencies, promoting to parish EOCs the value of real-time situation reports from radio amateurs, and to educate amateur radio emergency operators to become embedded with their served agencies prior to activation. The ARRL Board of Directors has formally endorsed a proposed program calling on ARRL to cover the $35 application fee for licensed candidates younger than 18 years old. With more details on this latest initiative by the ARRL, we go to league headquarters where Rick Lindquist, WW1ME, files this report. The FCC is not expected to implement the $35 application fee schedule until sometime in 2022. The board approved the Youth Licensing Grant Program at its July meeting in Windsor, Connecticut. The program concept, first raised at the board's annual meeting in January, was reviewed by an ad hoc committee, which expanded the scope of the original motion made by ARRL Southeastern Division Director Mickey Baker and 4MB. Under the program, ARRL would cover a one-time $35 application fee for each qualified candidate who passes one or more amateur radio exams taken on the same day at a single examination. Tests would have to be administered by a volunteer examiner team working under the auspices of the ARRL volunteer examiner coordinator. Qualified candidates would also pay a reduced exam session fee of $5 to the ARRLVEC. I'm Rick Lindquist, WW1ME. Goals of the program include expanding the reservoir of trained operators, technicians, and electronics experts within the amateur radio community and removing a financial obstacle to young people who wish to acquire an amateur radio license as a means of encouraging potential careers in science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. The new program also would enhance the ARRL's position as the leader in volunteer testing, the board motion said. The board believes that the recruitment and training of young amateur radio operators is a necessary and proper mission of the ARRL and that subsidization of the $35 fee will reduce the number of new amateurs that otherwise would be lost from these groups, the board said. The board said ARRL headquarters staff would determine the method of qualifying applicants and instruct volunteer examiner teams, giving the teams flexibility to determine that a candidate is eligible for reimbursement in the absence of documented proof. The board envisioned that the VEC would pay the FCC directly. The new program initially would serve up to 1,000 new license applicants younger than 18 years old. The motion gave ARRL staff complete latitude to determine how payment is delivered to the FCC or to reimburse eligible applicants. The program length is indefinite. It may be renewed or terminated by the Administration and Finance Committee or by the Board of Directors. The motion carried with applause from board members. And now with the latest technology news and commentary from Petaluma, California. This Week in Amateur Radio is proud to present Leo Laporte. Oh, now it's time for me to talk. I was under my desk. Excuse me. <laughs> when you're a tech guy. Hello, everybody. Leo Laporte here, the tech guy. When you're a tech guy, uh, you often go under your desk, right? Am I, am I ringing a bell? You know, you reach under there because there's wiring and stuff. And I had a new wireless charger I needed to plug in. And that meant a trip down below. And it's funny because uh, whenever I go underneath this desk... My engineers come running in. It's no, they, it's not that they think I had a heart attack or something and have fallen, but because. <laughs> 
because they don't like seeing me go down there because they know danger, Will Robinson. I might do something and break things. I didn't. Everything's fine. Charger's working. If you're the type of person that spends a little bit of time clambering beneath your desk, this is the show for you. Let's see. What happened this week? Microsoft has broken Windows 11 by putting ads in it. What? Mm, what? If you are uh, one of the Windows insiders downloading uh, the new version of Windows 11, you might have noticed that your start menu and taskbar was crashing. Turns out it was caused, according to Daniel Ex Alexanderson, by Windows 11 delivering ads for Microsoft Teams. And uh, there's a registry fix that will remove it. <laughs> But I'm sure Microsoft will fix that at some point. Kind of hard to believe. A, that Microsoft is putting ads in a paid operating system. And B, that it's crashing it. But there you go. I just thought I'd mention that in case you've had that problem. U.S. government is saying don't take Labor Day weekend off if you're in IT. Mass exploitation of a flaw in Atlassian's confluence, which is a Actually, we use it. It's a widely used program to kind of document what you're doing in a system and so forth. Is ongoing. The exploitation is ongoing according to the Cyber National Mission Force. I didn't even know there was such a thing. CNMF. U.S. Cybercom also stressed the importance of patching vulnerable Confluence servers as soon as possible. Here's the quote. Please patch immediately if you haven't already. This cannot wait until after the weekend. Turns out long weekends like this are uh, fertile ground for bad bad boys who like to put ransomware and things on your machines because people are going to be gone for a few days. Gives them some time. Action required. Patch immediately, says U.S. Cyber Command. Okay. <laughs> Just passing this along. These are the important stories. I'm passing them along. Apple, remember we had all that conversation about Apple putting stuff on your iPhone to scan for child sexual abuse material? People getting upset that Apple was invading their phone. Apple said, no, we're going to do this in a way that's private and secure. And people said, but yeah, you shouldn't be scanning anything on my phone. Apple has now said, okay, okay. Based on feedback from customers, advocacy groups, research, and others, we've decided to take additional time over the coming months to collect input and make improvements before releasing these critically important child safety features. You see what you made us do, Apple saying? You see? It's your fault. Okay, fine. Apple has also announced eight states that will allow you to put your driver's license in your iPhone wallet. Connecticut, Iowa, Kentucky, Maryland, Oklahoma, and Utah will follow Arizona and Georgia. That's where it's going to happen first. I don't want to be the first person who gets pulled over by the highway patrol and says, here, officer, my driver's license is on my phone. I don't want to be that person. They need special hardware to read it. It's fine. Uh, we are waiting for an Apple event. We did not get an invite. I never do, but no one else did uh, for an event that would have presumably been Wednesday. Apple doesn't like to do events the day after the holiday. They always want they want to do these iPhone events. The iPhone 13 is expected this month. They want to do these events usually on the first Tuesday of the month. But, of course, first Tuesday this month is the day after Labor Day. They don't like to do that. So... With people were thinking maybe the 8th, but if it were the 8th, I think we would know by now. So now push it out. Let's say the second Tuesday, which is the 14th, which is the latest second Tuesday possible, according to my math. I might be wrong. I, my math's not, it's notoriously not very good. Uh, September 14th, if you're waiting to hear about a new iPhone, perhaps a new Apple Watch, that would be the time. Expect chip shortages, however, to continue this year slowing things down remember it's not the main chip in the phone or the watch or the laptop because apple's ordered those ahead of time and the company that makes them the taiwan semiconductor manufacturing company tsmc is uh cranking them out as fast as their little feet can they don't use their feet as their uh, as their giant conveyor belts can but it's the other little chips the you know the legacy nodes as apple calls them the old stuff that uh, is in short supply so, spec delays. Here's some interesting news. We talk, I've talked a lot about how I don't like Bluetooth because uh, it's highly compressed, so the audio is not very good, and I have yet to hear a good pair of Bluetooth headphones, at least one that could compare with wired headphones. That's about to change. 
Qualcomm has a new Bluetooth codec called AptX Lossless that will sound as good as a wired pair of headphones, they say. It'll be as good as a CD or better. Don't worry, you have to get a new phone and a new hearing, uh, you know, headphones to do it, and those won't be available till early next year. So you have some time. You have some time. Oh, that's cute. There's a girl learning how to roller skate outside. I don't know if you could see her. Uh, I'm gonna. Uh, yeah, there she goes. Uh, that's cute. I think her boyfriend's teaching her how to roller skate. <laughs> anyway. Um, Big story of the week, though, and I imagine we'll be talking more about this low cast. You know, if you um, if you watch free broadcast television, ad supported broadcast television, or a show like this, ad supported radio, you are the product. We are selling your ears, your listening, your viewership to advertisers. That's how we make money. You are the product. The advertisers are our customers, in effect. If you pay a cable company to watch those channels, then you are the customer, not the product. You're paying them. You're their customer. Unless, unless they're doing additional things to make you the product. And actually, that's what broadcast TV people do. Everything's moving to streaming, right? Even radio, even this great old format, this wonderful legacy format that we love so very much. Even that is moving to the Internet. Right, streaming is the is the thing is the next big thing. We just know that's going to happen. Cable companies know that's going to happen too, and broadcasters most of all know that that's going to happen. They're trying to figure out what to do. So broadcasters, this is a little complicated. You channel, you know, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. The big, you know, network television stations in that city near you broadcast through the air for free, advertising supported. In which case, you're the product. They also have the choice to be on cable, but they have two choices. They can say, you have to carry us cable companies, and the cable companies will put you on. Or they can say, we want retransmission rights. We want you to pay us. The cable companies can say no, but if they say yes, which they always do because you want Channel 5, right? So the cable companies then pay the TV stations for the right to put them on the cable. Retransmission rules complicated. This is the FCC set this up, so of course it's complicated. But that puts the broadcasters in this interesting position of making money on ads and making money on the cable companies. You are both the product and the consumer, and they like it because guess what? They, they're double dipping. They make a lot of money. So when a company comes along, like let's say Lowcast and streams these channels over the internet without permission and without paying. These guys hate it. But wait, you might say, you're already d doing that over... If I had an antenna, I could do it. I'm just, instead of using the antenna, I'm using the internet. And Locast will only give you stations that are in your area. They were in about uh, half of the country. Like I could... I'm in Northern California, but I'm far enough away from San Francisco that I can't use an antenna unless I had a very high antenna to get the local stations in San Francisco. So I could either pay cable or I could use Locast and stream it and they would give me the San Francisco stations, except they can't anymore. So they had a clever trick, they thought, to get around this problem of, well, you can't make money streaming television stations without permission. So they said, well, we're not making money. We're a nonprofit. You, do you know about Locast? Locast.org. You can't see it anymore. You used to be able to go there and if you were in one of the covered markets, which again was more than half the U.S., you could watch your local stations for free, except every few minutes they'd interrupt them with a thing saying, hey, we're nonprofit, give us five bucks a month. I mean, the uh, television stations really hated Locast, and they went after them. Actually, the cable companies probably too, because it's undermining everybody's business. If you can get local stations over the internet, you probably don't even need cable, right? So everybody hated them. Finally, a judge has ruled just uh, just this week that Locast is not doing it right because they're taking the $5. They shouldn't be making any money on it. The nonprofit rules mean you can't invest that $5 in improving your technology, expanding to other markets, and that's what they've been doing. So the judge said, stop it. So Locast said, okay, fine, and has shut down suddenly, this like yesterday. Boom. We are suspending operations effective immediately says Locast. It was, you know what? 
I've been telling you about Locast for a couple of years now, recommending it, saying this is great, but also with the full knowledge that at some point <laughs> the chickens were coming home to roost, and now they're living right there in the chicken house. As a nonprofit, Locast says on their website front page, Locast was designed from the very beginning to operate in accordance with the strict letter of the law. <sighs> I'm putting in the sigh, but deep sigh. <gasps> but in response to the court's recent rulings with which we respectfully disagree, we are hereby suspending operations effective immediately. They might as well just add another sentence. And this is why we can't have nice things. I kind of honestly, I didn't expect it to last. This was kind of inevitable. This was an example of uh, trying to get around the law with a little bit of a, of a loophole. Oh, we're a nonprofit, except eh, maybe they weren't that much of a nonprofit. Because they were taken, they were made four million last year, and they were taking that and expanding operations. And the judge said, "You can't do that and be a nonprofit." So there. So they said, "Well, fine. So long." This is not the first company that's tried to do this. Remember, Aereo? They also were put out of business by the U.S. Supreme Court. Uh, I don't know if Locast is going to appeal this. I don't know what they're going to do. But for now, sad to say, your free ride is over, kids. No more free ride. And, uh, and the TV stations, once again, have won, and now they can double dip once again, charge your cable company, charge you thereby, and put ads in their content. At least this show is free. I am not charging you one penny. Anyway, I'm glad you were here, and I'm here, and I'll be here next week, and I hope you'll come by and bring your friends, too, as we talk high tech. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Are you ready for another trip into amateur radio history? I'm Bill Continelli, W2XOY, and I'll be back in a moment with another edition of the Ancient Amateur Archives, here on This Week in Amateur Radio. Ever since I entered the world of amateur and CB radio in the late 1960s, I wanted a station that was portable and battery-operated for traveling and emergency use. Thus, over the years, I avoided the big tube-type rigs and instead focused on radios such as the Heathkit HW8, the realistic DX150B, homebrew transistorized QRP CW transmitters, 5-watt CB walkie-talkies, and other HF and VHF rigs that could fit in a duffel bag and operate anywhere. I kept Rayovac and Union Carbide in business with my battery purchases. This policy paid me many dividends, from the numerous QSOs I had on the road in my Volkswagen bus, to the many snow and ice storms I lived through in Buffalo, New York, to the time, in 1978, when I was on board a Greyhound bus in a snowstorm. We got stuck at a railroad crossing, and it was my call on my 2-meter HT that brought help. Over the years, I developed a habit of carrying a radio bag, usually a small briefcase, that contained various portable rigs, spare batteries, and antennas. In fact, the last time I ventured out of the house without the radio bag was on January 11th, 1981. On that fateful day, as I made a quick run to the store, my old VW bus threw a rod, and as I pushed it off the road, I witnessed a car pedestrian accident in which a boy was critically injured. From that day forward, my motto was, where I go, so goes the radios. I adhered to that policy on September 11, 2001, when I boarded the 510 AM Amtrak out of Albany, New York, bound for Manhattan, 142 miles to my south. My latest version of the radio bag was a small computer case, which held a Yaesu FT-50 Dual Band HT, an Alinko FT-1, a Cobra CB walkie-talkie, a Sony IC-10 pocket size AM-FM shortwave receiver, a sharp Zorus palm top with built-in email capability, telescopic antennas, and spare batteries. I was prepared, so I thought. I arrived at Penn Station in Manhattan at 7.30 a.m. A taxi brought me to our New York City office on Lower Broadway, just four blocks from the World Trade Center at 8 a.m. My meeting was on the 27th floor, but in an interior room far away from the windows. With all the noise in the room, we did not hear the first crash. A few minutes later, someone came in and told us about the plane hitting the North Tower. I pulled out the Sony, tuned to WINS 1010 AM, and we all listened to the initial reports. We just started to resume our meeting when we heard and felt 
the second plane crash into the South Tower. We terminated the meeting and left the office. We tried to get info from the people leaving the other offices, but they were too traumatized to tell us what happened. As we walked down the 27 flights of stairs, the Sony gave us the information. When we arrived at the street, the streets were chaotic and the view was horrific. Since we were in front of a federal building and across from the federal courthouse, there were federal police everywhere. I tried their frequency, 417.2 megahertz, but all transmissions were scrambled. Not knowing the 2 meter and 70 centimeter repeater frequencies in Manhattan, I quickly scanned both bands on the FT-50, but I heard nothing. The federal police warned us to get away from the federal buildings, and so we started walking north. Along the way, a co-worker held the Sony, still tuned to 1010 winds, where we received excellent news updates. Not knowing the police, fire, or EMS frequencies for New York City, I started scanning the VHF and UHF bands. I heard many stations, but none were actually at ground zero. I then tried the FRS channels. They were a jumble of voices, some in English. Many were near ground zero and described in terrifying detail what they saw. At this point, neither tower had collapsed. I switched over to the 156 megahertz marine band and heard a couple of stations, presumably in the Hudson River, give first-hand accounts of what they saw. I then tried the Cobra CB. Most channels were clogged with skip, but I did hear stations on channel 9, 15, and 19, probably on the West Side Highway, describing what they saw. We stopped at the Holiday Inn in Chinatown, about 10 blocks above Ground Zero. While we were there trying to call our families and co-workers on dead cell phones and overloaded landlines, the towers collapsed. We decided to walk to Penn Station, 45 blocks away, and wait for a train, even though WYNS announced that the station was closed and no trains were running. On the march north, a co-worker held the Sony while I scanned around. Once again, I tried the VHF, UHF, and 800 megahertz frequencies for police, fire, and EMS, but I soon realized that without a specific frequency list, it was like looking for a needle in a haystack. I then switched to the railroad frequencies, scanning between 160.2 and 161.4 megahertz in 15 kilohertz steps. Here, I was more successful. I found six hot frequencies where we heard the Amtrak and MTA police scouring the tunnels with bomb-sniffing dogs. And, despite the announcements on 1010 winds, we heard the employees at Penn Station getting the trains ready for the soon-to-be massive exodus from the city. Our 45-block walk to Penn Station, we were looking back every minute to watch the massive clouds of smoke and ash rise from the ruins. We had left Lower Broadway just in time. Otherwise, we also might be covered in ash and dust, as we saw on many emergency vehicles that passed us. We also saw many people coated head to foot in ash and dust. When we reached Penn Station, there were at least 20 to 25,000 people milling about outside. Official word via Penn Station people with bullhorns and WINS was that the station was closed, but the Yesu told us a different story. Thus, while many people trudged off to walk across one of the bridges or find a hotel, we stayed put. The Yesu and the Sony made us many friends in the crowd. They were literally draped over our shoulders to hear the latest news or scanner call. Many only had cell phones, now useless with overload, so we were the only source of information. For a few minutes, I switched over to shortwave, tuning through everything from the BBC to the militia stations. None of them were as up-to-date as WYNS, so we stayed on the AM band. Finally, the Yesu gave us welcome news. The station would open in 15 minutes for northbound Amtrak and Metro North passengers. The Amtrak door was on 34th Street. We rushed to that entrance two minutes ahead of the bullhorn announcements. Inside, we stayed glued to the Yesu as crew set up the trains. When we heard that the northbound Amtrak would depart from Gate 6, we made a beeline for it, arriving before the PA announcement. Thus, we were the first passengers on the first Amtrak train out of New York City. Once we were moving, our speed was only 30 miles an hour versus the 100 plus miles per hour that Amtrak uses on that line. Our conductor said it was because of the backlog of all the trains, but the Yesu told a different story. They were afraid of sabotage, so we stayed at 30 miles per hour all the way to Albany. 
We listened to the Amtrak and CSX police along the way, checking out the line for anything unusual. And, as we pulled into the station, the Yesu gave us warning of the media waiting for our train. So, what did I learn from this experience? First, having the radios was not enough. I needed the amateur repeater frequencies, the subaudible tones, and the offsets, as well as the Manhattan emergency frequencies. I wasted a lot of time in random searches and probably passed many active frequencies that were temporarily quiet. With frequencies widely available on the internet, there's no excuse not to be prepared when you visit another city. Second, pre-program your radios if possible. Myesu's memory channels are a hodgepodge of frequencies including TV and weather transmissions that will stop any scanning in its tracks. If your scanner or HT has banks, pre-program one or two banks with about 20 of the top frequencies you will need. Then you can lock out the rest and concentrate on the priority channels. Third, choose your radios carefully. In retrospect, I should have had a GMRS or FRS radio with me. There may be situations where you need to communicate with non-hams. REACT operates a coast-to-coast -coast system of emergency repeaters on 462.675 MHz, and the FRS emergency channel is 462.5625 MHz, which is FRS channel 1. Fourth, bring an earphone or a headset. I didn't mind half of 33rd Street listening to WYNS, but I wanted the information from the Yesu only for me and my group. Since September 11th, I've gone to Buffalo twice in Seattle, Washington. I was more prepared. I have a trip to Phoenix coming up next week, and I've downloaded and programmed key frequencies into the Yesu and Alinko. There's a second radio bag packed for the Phoenix trip. It has FRS and GMRS radios, as well as a brand new Yesu FT-817. I'm going well prepared and in style. This is Bill Continelli, W2XOY, for this week in Amateur Radio. This is November 3, Victor Echo Mike, with your month ending August 2021 Parks on the Air update. Be sure to visit parksontheair.com for more information about the program and poda.app for spotting, park information, leaderboards, and more. This month in Parks on the Air news, we have two exciting updates to share with everybody. Uh, first, we are excited to announce that we have recently added over 1,000 parks to the Parks on the Air system. For the last several months, we've had a small contingent of volunteers combing through user requests to add additional parks, validating that those requested parks meet the criteria for inclusion in POTA, and formatting the list so that they could be added to the system. After hundreds of volunteer hours, the lists are now in the system and ready for you to go activate. Check out the maps and search pages at POTA.app to see if any of these new units are in your area. Also in POTA news, we're excited to share that we are formalizing a Parks on the Air support desk. You can always continue to get community support via the Facebook group or via the POTA help channel in the POTA Slack group, but we have a small group of volunteers that have agreed to be on a rotating schedule to help you with your official technical support questions. To reach the official POTA support desk, all you need to do is send an email to help at parksontheair.com. We have coverage for most days of the week, so you will usually get a response within 24 hours, but no worse than 48 hours based on our volunteers' schedules. We won't solve every problem that fast, but you'll know that we're on it. Issues requiring level two support are generally resolved within the week. And now for our monthly update. August was a very busy month for Parks on the Air. During the month, there were over 180,000 contacts made by about 1,200 different activators. They put nearly 3,000 parks on the air from 25 different DX entities, and all of those parks and entities were hunted by more than 23,000 different hunters. The top activators for the month were K7CAR with 3,399 QSOs and W0YES who activated 72 different parks. The top hunter for the month was N5HA with 967 QSOs while hunting 691 different parks. In our POTA DX corner, Canada was unsurprisingly the most active entity outside of the continental United States, with 12,382 QSOs being made from parks in the Great White North. Not to be outdone, however, we had quite a bit of activity from Japan, Alaska, Puerto Rico, England, Wales, France, and many others. The top DX activators for the month were VE9MY with 1,579 QSOs 
and VE2NCG, who activated 26 parks. And this concludes our August 2021 Parks on the Air update. As always, the team at Parks on the Air wishes you safe activations and happy hunting. 73. Foundations of Amateur Radio Over the past few weeks, I've been having my hearing tested. I've had the opportunity to discuss sound in some detail with an audiologist. Today, as a result of a collision between a jar of chili pickles and a tiled floor, I've come to the realisation that sound is important in unexpected ways. It will probably not come as a surprise to you that sound has an emotional component. Just think of a particular song or a voice or something that you've heard previously. The sound of a jackhammer or a bell, a horse or a jet, each completely different impact on your mood. Some sounds are pleasant, others jarring. Some make you feel happy, others make you anxious or even angry. For some time now, I've observed in myself that there are times when I cannot stand sound and other times when I invite it into my life. For example, if there's a HF radio going in the background and I'm attempting to have a conversation with a person in the shack, the sound coming from the radio causes irritation, to the point of needing to turn it off in order to actually hold a conversation. On the other hand, if there's a contest on, I can sit happy as a clam listening to HF all day and night, working out what station is calling and making contact. I'm raising this because it occurs to me that amateur radio is unlike broadcast radio, where you're expected to actively monitor what is being transmitted. In my experience as a radio broadcaster, you're talking into a microphone, and the headphones you're wearing are connected to a radio receiver, which is tuned to the station on which you're broadcasting. This gives you immediate live feedback on the state of your audio levels. As an aside, I once witnessed a fellow broadcaster who didn't feel the need to wear headphones. They were blissfully unaware that their voice was being transmitted into silence because the audio fader on their microphone was down. In amateur radio, however, we don't often do such things. We transmit blind most, if not all of the time. It's rare that we even hear our own voice on air, let alone hear it in real time. If that's not enough, using sideband, it's easy to modify the sound of a person by changing the frequency slightly, making their voice either higher or lower, just by adjusting the dial. It occurred to me that how your voice is perceived by the other station assists in how that station can hear you and make contact. Using the local repeater is a good but subtle example. If you've listened for a while, you might have observed that there are stations that are easy to understand and others that are not. Sometimes that comes down to individual accents, but in my experience, a much larger impact is caused by the actual transmission itself. Is the microphone gain set correctly? Is there any filtering in play? Is the station on the correct frequency? Is the transmitter using the correct mode? And other more subtle things like background noise, speaking volume and distance and direction in relation to the microphone. We often talk about less being more, and you already know that I'm a big fan of low power or QRP operation. Making contacts is absolutely about using the right antenna, the right mode, the correct band and time of day. But the sound coming from your station is just as important. If you have the ability to use two radios simultaneously, then I'd recommend that you find a way to either use a local repeater or a cross-band repeater or even a remote web-based radio to hear what you actually sound like, on air, live, and experiment with various settings on your radio, in order to test and improve the quality of your voice. Whilst we as radio amateurs don't standardise our signals, though personally I think it would be a great idea, there's plenty of improvement to be had by taking some time out of your next on-air activity to have a long, hard listen to yourself. I'm Ono, Victor Kilo 6, Foxtrot Lima, Alpha Bravo. The ARRL reports that the Northern California DX Foundation has donated $100,000 to the upcoming 3Y0J de-expedition to Bouvet Island, which is set for late 2022. The de-expedition will be carried out by Amateur Radio De-Expeditions, a Norwegian non-profit organization created for the purpose of conducting the activation of rare or remote locations. The Northern California DX Foundation is now the de-expedition's lead sponsor.
The three Yankees Zero Juliet team said that they wished to recognize and thank the Northern California DX Foundation as the lead sponsor for the 3Y0J expedition to Bouvet, and without their support, operations to the world's rarest entities would be difficult. A dependency of Norway, Bouvet is a sub-Antarctic island in the South Atlantic. It's the second most wanted DXCC entity behind North Korea. The three Yankee Zero Juliet team said that with its overall budget of $650,000, this de-expedition to Bouvet will be one of the most expensive ever. With the NXDXF donation, the team hopes to succeed in their fundraising, as the first payment milestone for the vessel contract is approaching. About a third of the cost of the vessel contract is due by the end of October, and the de-expedition said it wanted to have confidence that it could succeed financially. They say they critically need upfront donations to be able to make it. While they have a solid plan, a young and strong team, a dedicated crew and the vessel Maramar, they need your support to get there and to make 120,000 QSOs from Cape Fee at Bouvet. Three co-leaders are heading up the de-expedition. They are Ken, Lima Alpha 7 Gulf India Alpha, Runa, Lima Alpha 7 Tango Hotel Alpha and Ervan, Lima Bravo 1 Quebec India. Donations to the 3Y0J expedition are invited via PayPal or through the 3Y0J website. You can also visit the 3Y0J expedition Facebook page. In June, the Intrepid DX Group announced that it was cancelling its long-anticipated expedition to Bouvet Island after it lost its vessel contract. Time now for the MSAT report. The University of Maine is working on a satellite called MESAT-1. It's scheduled to be launched next June. The most interesting part of this satellite is that it will carry a global star transmitter along with an MSAT linear transponder and a GPS receiver. This will allow the satellite to generate its own two-line element sets, or TLEs. GPS in satellites was first tested on AO-40 many years ago. Launched in November of 1974, the venerable A07 satellite is now in full sunlight, which means it's working. This causes the transmitter to automatically switch between mode A, 145 MHz up, 29 MHz down, and mode B, 432 MHz up, and 145 MHz down. If you do not hear the satellite in one mode, check the other. Even a small portable 10-meter antenna will let you hear the satellite, but a dipole or Yagi will give better results. The Mode A transponder uplink is 145.85 to 145.95 MHz, and the downlink is 29.4 to 29.5 MHz. It's a non-inverting transponder. Full illumination will last until next April 11th, so there's plenty of time to get things together to work this satellite in both modes. The AMSAT report comes to us each week courtesy of Bruce Page, KK5DO. Sunwatcher Tad Cook, K7RA in Seattle, reports that sunspot activity increased dramatically this week. Sunspot numbers peaked at 87 on Wednesday, September 8th, but the next day, the daily sunspot number hit 124. Cook says we haven't seen activity like that in about six years when the daily sunspot number reached 125. In her report from earlier this month, space weather woman Tamitha Scove, WX6SWW, said things seem to be headed in the right direction. Uh, we're not going to be expecting all that much more when it comes to activity, but we are going to expect that that solar flux is going to easily stay in the mid-80s, possibly even boost up into the 90s, and that gets us closer to the good range for uh, radio propagation on Earth's day side. And hopefully these conditions are going to continue easily over the next week. So good times lie ahead. I'm Rick Lindquist, WW1ME. Ham Radio Science Citizen Investigation or HAMSI founder Nathaniel Frizzell, W2NAF, an assistant professor in the University of Scranton's Physics and Engineering Department, has been awarded a $481,260 grant through the NASA Space Weather Applications Operations Phase II Research Program. Frizzell will serve as principal investigator for a research project entitled Enabling Space Weather Research with Global Scale Amateur Radio Datasets. He'll collaborate with Philip Erickson, W1PJE of the Massachusetts Institute of Technology Haystack Observatory, and Bill Engelite, 
AB4EJ at the University of Alabama. The grant includes significant funding for participation of Scranton undergraduate students in this research, as well as support for new computation sources, Firzel said. He explained that the grant will fund the development of an empirical model for the prediction of traveling ionospheric disturbances, or TIDs in high-frequency radio communications, while investigating the geophysical drivers of these disturbances. The grant will cover two years of work. Frizzell said that the predictive empirical TID models will be developed using data collected by the Reverse Beacon Network, WSPR, and PSK Reporter, Automated Global Scale Radio Communications Observation Networks, operated by the amateur radio community. Undergraduate students will help with faculty researchers to create algorithms used for the model development. The new NASA award complements a five-year National Science Foundation grant of more than $616,000 that Frizzell received in 2020. That investigation aims to understand the source of traveling ionospheric disturbances observed in amateur radio and other scientific data sets. In 2019, Frizzell received a $1.3 million National Science Foundation grant to fund a three-year initiative to measure modulations produced in the Earth's upper atmosphere. The grant supports a collaborative team to develop the HAMSI Personal Space Weather Station, a modular, multi-instrument, ground-based science observation platform used to study variability in the coupled geospace system and to better understand HF radio propagation. This is Frizzell's second NASA grant. A space physicist, he is among the researchers working on a NASA Living with a Star program project. Wave-driven asymmetries in the ionosphere and thermosphere due to asymmetries in the northern and southern polar vortices. That project is being led by Richard Collins of the University of Alaska Fairbanks Geophysical Institute at HARP. As a result of the Billsdale transmitter fire in Yorkshire, UK, in early August, many people are still without terrestrial television. The Northern Echo newspaper reports that the Member of Parliament for Stockton North, Alex Cunningham, announced that he had written a letter to Ofcom calling for a full inquiry into what he called the wholly inadequate response from site operators Arkiva. The letter highlighted the MP's concerns about the lack of plan from Arkiva and the slow progress of talks between Arkiva and the neighbouring landowner. The letter also touches on the limited support available to customers by Arkiva, which according to the MP includes that they've not provided a fully staffed helpline and are instead providing an automated message. Member of Parliament for Thirsk and Moulton, Kevin Hollinrake, supported Alex Cunningham's letter and expressed that Arkiva had neglected to follow proper processes. He said he agreed with Mr Cunningham's letter and was not surprised to learn that his constituents' experiences were the same as those in Stockton North. It appears Arkiva have neglected to follow proper processes, he said, which has now led to further delays in the restoration of services. Following a meeting with Arkiva last week, Kevin Hollinrake contacted the Secretary of State for Culture, Media and Sport, Oliver Dowden, the Minister for Media, John Whittingdale, the North York Moors National Park Planning Authority and Natural England to help seek a solution. He will continue to press for a near immediate resolution to this. He echoed Mr Cunningham's sentiment that efforts to date have been wholly inadequate. Chancellor of the Exchequer Rishi Sunak said that he had also been in regular contact with mast operator Arkiva and he was concerned to hear that the situation had made people feel more isolated. He was urging all parties involved to do everything possible to resolve the situation as soon as possible. He said that many of his constituents had been without a terrestrial TV signal for weeks now and it was having a detrimental impact on their lives. He said he'd received a considerable amount of correspondence from constituents who had been further affected by the delays to restore services. A spokesperson for Ofcom, the regulator, said that they were very concerned about the local impact of the fire on Freeview viewers. They are monitoring the steps being taken by Arkiva and broadcasters to restore services as quickly as possible and to provide information to those affected. Last Thursday, a spokesperson for Arkiva said that they wholeheartedly apologised for the disruption this had caused to people's everyday lives, especially those who rely on television for companionship. They recognised the frustrations of those who were still living without TV and would like to reassure everyone that they are doing everything in their power to bring services back for as many people as possible as quickly as they can. 
Their teams were working around the clock and their recovery plans had meant that many people had had their services restored. Their plan included using a combination of their existing sites and temporary structures where they'd been able to and planning for the building of an 80 metre temporary mast on land near the existing mast. Arkiva said that they are ready to begin the build as soon as they've secured the permissions required to do so. Arkiva said that the processes are not under their direct control and they continue to require the help and support of their partners to achieve the permissions they need as quickly as possible so that they can restore services to the people who need them. Arkiva will provide an update on progress as soon as they can. Meanwhile, North Yorkshire Fire Service have said investigations are ongoing into the cause of the fire at Billsdale Mast, however, it is not being treated as deliberate. You can read the full story and keep across updates by going to www.thenorthernecho.co.uk forward slash news. The El Dorado County Amateur Radio Club in California has been providing radio communication support for small and large animal rescue efforts during the Caldera Fire. Members of the South County Large Animal Rescue Group, El Dorado County Animal Services, and other volunteers have been addressing the need. Many of the El Dorado County Amateur Radio Club volunteers are also members of the club's Neighborhood Radio Watch program. As the California Caldor Fire destroyed the community of Grizzly Flats, threatened Lake Tahoe, and caused evacuations in dozens of communities throughout the county, thousands of area residents were forced to flee their homes without having time to round up their pets and livestock. We desperately love our animal companions, whether big or small, and being separated and unable to care for them in the midst of a disaster is truly heart-wrenching said Alan Thompson, W6WN, the club's public information officer. Because of the mountainous terrain, many of our neighborhoods already had little or no cell or internet communication, and the fire only made things worse. Thompson said the club quickly deployed its mobile ARRL Amateur Radio Emergency Services Communication Center, maintained by Jay Harmer, KE6JLA, which is in service as Central Net Operations. Several members stepped up, including Dale Dennis, KJ6HHY from Yolo Aries, and Tom Newman, NN6H, from Alameda County Radio Amateur Civil Emergency Service and part of the Alameda County Sheriff's Communications Team. They volunteered their time in radios to accompany their animal rescue teams dispatched into impacted areas. The hams themselves are getting support too. They're being joined by volunteers in the club's Neighborhood Radio Watch program, area residents using inexpensive General Mobile Radio Service, or GMRS, radios. Teams of South County Large Animal Rescue members, animal services personnel, public employees, and radio communication staff have been conducting daily animal rescue missions and welfare checks throughout the impacted areas. Until residents are permitted to return, these teams are providing food, water, and care to abandoned animals. Thompson said those seeking an animal evacuation or welfare check should contact El Dorado County Animal Services, Western Slope, area code 530-621-5795, or the shelter at 530-621-7631. In the South Tahoe area, call 530-573-7925. South County Large Animal Rescue will respond as directed by El Dorado County Animal Services. They cannot self-deploy or respond directly to phone calls for assistance, Thompson said. The crew of the Russian segment of the International Space Station have reported smoke and the smell of burned plastic as fire and smoke alarms went off this past Thursday morning. Russia's space agency Roscosmos said the incident took place at 0155 GMT on Thursday in the Russian-built Svezda module as the station's batteries were being recharged. This prompted an air cleanse of the Russian segment to eliminate possible smoke pollution. This aggregate filter for cleaning the atmosphere was turned on before crews returned to normal operations, but it did not make clear whether or not there would have been a risk to the crew had the filters not been activated. French astronaut Thomas Pesquet said the smell of burning plastic or electronic equipment wafted into the U.S. segment of the station, though, according to CBS News. The Svezda module has experienced a number of safety issues, with smoke reported in the module in 2014 and several air leaks, including one earlier this year and another in 2019. The crew reportedly noticed smoke and the smell of burnt plastic, a terrifying prospect for anyone trapped inside a tiny outpost in the vastness of space. It is especially worrying considering that materials can combust at lower temperatures of microgravity, according to NASA research. According to RIA, 
European Space Agency astronaut Thomas Pesquet and cosmonaut Oleg Novitsky first noticed an odor wafting in from the Russian segment around 5 a.m. Moscow time, and we still don't know what caused it. Fortunately, according to an update by Roscosmos, situation was contained, with air filters activated and crew being able to get back to bed last night. All systems operate normally. The composition of the air on board the station corresponds to the standard parameters, the Roscosmos statement reads, as translated by CBS News reporter William Harwood. The incident didn't even end up postponing a spacewalk scheduled for Thursday afternoon, the agency claimed. It's a serious incident that's bound to raise eyebrows, especially considering Russia's recently announced plans to abandon the station by 2025. Russia's state news has also increasingly discussed the worrying state of the aging orbital outpost. Just last week, Vladimir Solovyov, the chief engineer of the Russian space company Energia, warned that portions of the space station may be beyond repair. Literally a day after the in-flight systems are fully exhausted, irreparable failures may begin, Solovyov told Russian state media at the time, according to the BBC. It's still too early to draw any conclusions, but the timing of Solovyov's comments certainly are at the least intriguing. We have yet to find the exact cause of the smoke, but if recent events are anything to go by, coming to a conclusion may take some time. Russian authorities noted the existence of several cracks and air leaks causing air to slowly vent into open space, but both Roscosmos and NASA have maintained that crews were never in any danger. Superficial fissures have been found in some places on the Zarya module, Solovyov told state-owned news agency RAA late last month. This is bad and suggests that the fissures will begin to spread over time. Russia certainly seems to be ready to look beyond the ISS. On the one hand, there is a real chance that the outpost is starting to show its age. On the other, Russia's state news seems rather keen to paint the ISS as a foregone conclusion that isn't worth saving. The country has its own plans to establish an entirely separate space station in the upcoming years. All the while, NASA is still trying to come to an agreement with its international partners as to how to dispose of the station when its days are numbered within the next 10 years. Incidents like this certainly appear to show up more frequently as the ISS enters its 22nd year of continuous operations. What the future will hold for the outpost is anything but certain. All we can do is hope that its crews will never be in any serious danger. America's Appalachian Trail has always captured hikers' imaginations, and next month it will be capturing hundreds and hundreds of miles of radio signals. The 2,190-mile-long Appalachian Trail will present 2,190 miles of possibilities for summits on the air and parks on the air activators on Saturday, October 2nd. Summits on the air enthusiasts are already registering to activate summits that are within a short distance on the trail, and hams will be calling between 1200 UTC and 2100 UTC throughout the day. If you're an avid hiker, as well as a summits on the air or parks on the air activator, you have time to add your name and your summit or park of choice to the list by sending an email at ontheair at gmail.com. Summits on the air activators may also post an alert on SodaWatch. This event will be held on the same day as the W7 Alpha Summits to Summits 10 Point Madness, so it's recommended that parks on the air chasers stand by and defer to summits calling other summits. For details, visit Appalachian Trail on the Air website at www.ontheair.com. If you want to hear history as it happens, be listening for the audio retransmissions provided by the Launch Information Service and the Amateur Television System. They'll be retransmitting feeds of the countdown and the booster recovery of SpaceX Inspiration 4, a three-day mission featuring the first all-civilian crew inside a Crew Dragon spacecraft. It's a charity flight for the benefit of St. Jude's Children Research Hospital. Liftoff is tentatively scheduled for September 15th. According to Joel Dolinsky, W0WD, the LeeSats Amateur Radio Club repeater will carry feeds of the transmissions. There is also a Listen Live button on LeeSats.org, the LeeSats website which has links to Broadcastify. Listening may also be possible via Echolink at WB4ATV. The Citrus Belt Amateur Radio Club of San Bernardino, callsigned Whiskey 6 Juliet Bravo Tango, in California, is once again hosting probably one of the most fun special event activities, the 22nd annual Route 66 on the Air, between 00 UTC on Saturday, September the 11th, and 2359 UTC on Sunday, September the 19th.
The purpose of this event is to offer amateur radio operators a fun way to relive the ride of their own memories of Route 66 and to celebrate the highway's 95th anniversary. The United States Highway 66, established in 1926, was the first major improved highway to link the West Coast with the nation's heartland. Through stories, songs and TV shows, the highway came to symbolize the spirit of freedom of the open road, inspiring many to see America. So look out for a total of 22 stations, including two that are roving, operating in or around the major cities along the old Route 66, from Santa Monica in California to Chicago, Illinois. Each station has a Whiskey 6 call sign, followed by a single letter. For example, Whiskey 6 Hotel is being run by the Albuquerque DX Association of New Mexico. There are two official rover stations, Whiskey 6 Sierra and Whiskey 6 Tango, both run by the Northern Arizona DX Association. There's a long list of where the special event stations are expected to be found, all frequencies being plus or minus interference, of course. CW stations can usually be found near the bottom of each amateur band, frequencies ending in 3-3. For single sideband, look out for frequencies rather fittingly ending in 6-6. Digimodes can be found on frequencies generally ending in 7-4 if the band plan allows, but also look for digital modes in the standard band segments. Any amateurs operating whilst actually driving along Route 66 during the special event period are encouraged to take part in Route 66 on the air by using the designation Mobile 66 for single sideband or Stroke M66 for CW after their call signs. All other amateur radio operators are welcome to contact these mobile operators, but note that W6 Sierra and W6 Tango are the only official event rover stations and will be endorsed on the event certificate. Some of the participating clubs will also be operating in this event via their local VHF and UHF repeaters. Check the ARRL repeater guide for possible repeater frequencies if you're in the local area. A Route 66 log sheet has been devised. This simple log sheet can be used during the event for a quick log record. Simply click on whiskey 6 juliet bravo tangoorg navigate to the log sheet and download the PDF file. Be sure to print it in landscape orientation. This sheet is not to be used to request a certificate, as you must fill out the application under the 2021 Route 66 on the Air tab on the website homepage, and then click on the Certificate Request tab. Laminated stickers for car windows are also available from the same place. Each participating club will issue their own QSL card commemorating this event. QSL information is available, alongside more details about the event and the various certificates that are on offer, on the Route 66 OTA website at whiskey6juliet-bravo-tango.org. With an imagination fueled by NASA's Apollo missions a decade earlier, Martin Sweeting, G3YJO, went on to launch a new era in space himself, the age of microsatellites, which began as a homebrew project built partly at home and partly on the University of Surrey campus. That first, very basic, microsatellite, U0Sat-1, the granddaddy of all that would come later, was eventually launched by NASA in 1981. Martin, an amateur radio operator since his student years, recalls in a new interview with the BBC what it was like being the creator of the first microsatellite in the pre-internet era. More than amateur radio communication tools, today's microsatellites aid the world in navigation, scientific research, weather, and environmental monitoring. As satellite mega constellations now revolutionize communications yet further, Martin, a distinguished professor of space engineering at the university, also makes a plea to clean the skies of the hazard of space junk. The BBC posted the half-hour interview on the BBC Sounds website. The VOIP hurricane net will activate on September 11th at 0 to 0 600 UTC for Hurricane Larry, a Category 1 storm. The National Hurricane Center reports that Larry is moving quickly towards southeastern Newfoundland and is expected to bring hurricane force winds, dangerous storm surge, heavy seas, and heavy rainfall. As of 1200 UTC, Larry was about 650 miles southwest of Cape Race, Newfoundland, with maximum sustained winds of 85 miles per hour, moving to the north, northeast, at 26 miles per hour. Net Manager Rob Macedo, KD1CY, said reports on the Nets reporting form will be forwarded to the National Hurricane Centers, WX4, NHC, and via CanWarn. 
the volunteer organization of ham radio operators who report severe weather to Environment Canada. Stations in the affected area may connect via Allstar on node number 28848, Echolink on node number 7203, and the Hamshack Hotline 94032 and IRLP 9219. Reports may also be sent to KC5FM-9 on APRS, KC5FM at winlink.org, DSTAR on REF052B, or Wires X 43234. The net accepts Skywarn criteria reports, including damage, hail greater than a quarter inch, flooding, and other hazards. For more information, contact Macedo. The Hurricane WatchNet has announced that it will begin its activation September 10th at 2100 UTC on both 14.325 MHz and 7.268 MHz. In a new video, Bruce G4 Alpha Bravo X-Ray demonstrates a three-band portable vertical quarter-wave antenna which will operate in the 40, 30 and 20 meter bands. It's also suitable for a small garden if the matching unit is waterproofed. The matching section uses base loading coils and they're courtesy of QRP Guys. You can look at their website qrpguys.com. Bruce's application uses a 7 meter fiberglass fishing pole and a public address loudspeaker stand as the base support, so the antenna is completely freestanding. The design has four 10 foot radials. More radials will improve efficiency slightly, but at the expense of convenience because more or longer radials will not be so quick to deploy or wrap up afterwards. The complete antenna can be deployed or taken down in less than 10 minutes and the telescopic fiberglass mast is stored inside the loudspeaker stand for safe transportation and storage. The standing wave ratio, which is a measure of how much power is being wastefully reflected back from the antenna, is less than 1.7 to 1 for all three bands and, as this is a resonant design, no aerial tuning unit is needed. This makes it ideal for use with small portable transceivers such as the Yaesu FT817 or the ICOM IC705. Bruce uses this antenna in conjunction with his KX3 Go box and performance is very good. Power handling of the matching unit is 20 watts PEP, so it can also be used with a Zygu G90 transceiver. Bruce reminds everyone working portable to check that there are no overhead cables above the area where you plan to deploy the antenna. It's certainly very good advice never to deploy an antenna in the vicinity of overhead cables. Bruce says that anyone should feel free to emulate his design and experiment. After all, that's what this hobby is all about. If you just type in Golf 3 Alpha Bravo X-Ray into YouTube, you'll find lots of interesting videos by Bruce, and amongst them is a demonstration of this three-band portable antenna design. International Amateur Radio Union Region 1 President Don Beatty Golf 3 Bravo Juliet reports that the IARU has awarded medals to six radio amateurs. With the decision to hold the planned IARU October 2021 workshop event virtually, Region 1 is now not able to make planned in-person announcements or presentations of medals to recognise exceptional support for the region's work. The Executive Committee has therefore decided to move ahead now with the announcement, deferred from the 2020 Virtual General Conference, of the award of medals to six people. Dave Court, Echo India 3 India Oscar, recently retired having led the IARU Spectrum and Regulatory Liaison Committee through a period which resulted in the region-wide allocation to the amateur service of a 2 MHz segment at 50 MHz. Dave also played a role as a member of the Extended Executive Committee. Hilary Clayton-Smith, Golf 4 Juliet Kilo Sierra, is an Electromagnetic Compatibility Committee member and until recently its secretary for nearly 25 years. She was an IARU representative during discussions on power line telecommunications where power lines are used for data delivery, resulting in potential interference to radio spectrum users. Peter Yost, Hotel Bravo 9 Charlie Echo Tango, was the acting IARU Monitoring System Coordinator for a period until October 2020 and Deputy Coordinator for many years. The service is internationally recognised for the quality of its work.
Torre Warren, Lima Alpha 9 in Quebec, Lima, recently retired in various electromagnetic compatibility roles at the IARU and built a core team of around 25 country EMC specialists who meet regularly to review progress. Jacques Verlegen, Oscar November 4 Alpha Victor Juliet, recently retired as the VHF Plus Committee Chair, a post he held since 2014. In that time, he coordinated the work of VHF Plus areas, revised the VHF handbook, developed the contest working group, and surveyed VHF meteor scatter activity levels. And Hans Velens, Oscar November 6 Whiskey Quebec, built the concept of Support for the Amateur Service, STARS, from 1990, acting as its chairman until 2011. Hans believes passionately in the need to support the development of smaller societies and through his personal efforts has energetically enabled the development of a number of African societies. Don G3BJ congratulates these six people who have each made a very significant contribution to IARU Region 1's work over the years. And now, with his segment on tower climbing and antenna safety, here is Arizona's own Greg Stoddard, KF9MP. If you've gotten the reputation for doing climbing work for hams, sooner or later the word gets out and you become everyone's friend. Some of your friends may have real need of your services on their towers and even on their roofs. Sometimes pleas for antenna help are hard to say no to. Here's how I handle those situations. If you're doing work for a close relative, do all the install work yourself and only use quality parts and install them to be bomb proof so a return trip won't be necessary. But for upgrades or severe weather repairs, I use an approach similar to this. I tell them, sure, I'll do the job, but since my safety is the most important part of the job, if at any time I feel my safety may be in question, I will stop doing the job and they decide not to finish the work. For relatives, I never charge for tower or antenna work, but always tell them my safety disclaimer. So if I stop, they know ahead of time why and agreed to my rules before the work started. This way, I'm never telling them no when they ask for my help. For hams in general, I tell them I will examine the tower first before I decide if I will do the job. When I get there, I examine the condition of the tower. I look at how it is mounted and the overall size of the tower, width and height. I do not climb those tiny TV antenna towers that are narrower than my two feet side by side. I tell the owner this before I get there. If the tower is bent at all, or not perfectly vertical, I also decline the job. I have found that agreeing to look at the tower will save lots of guilt trips and sad stories. If you outline your criteria for rejecting jobs based on safety before going to see the tower, you can eliminate the dangerous jobs with the minimum of hurt feelings. When you do accept a job for a fellow amateur radio operator, take the opportunity to preach the gospel about safe climbing. Show them your belt and ropes and all your safety gear you've gathered over the years. I always keep mine covered in the back of the car so it's always ready to show. Just the sight of proper climbing gear impresses people the extent to which you value your personal safety. I take time to appoint someone to act as ground crew supervisor and charge them with keeping everyone far away from the base of the tower. If kids are present, I sometimes drop a screwdriver to impress them with what would happen to their heads if they hung around the base of the tower when something fell. While I'm on the subject of doing work for other hams, I'd like to mention a cheap and durable sidearm for the typical home antenna tower. I use inch or larger conduit and put a proper bend in one end, then clamp it to the tower. It is necessary to drill at least one hole and pin it to the tower to prevent rotating in the wind. I would ask a professional electrician to bend the conduit for me if you have no experience doing that yourself since it is easy to kink it and ruin it. Remember, tower work at any height can easily become deadly. Money spent on books, videos, and climbing gear is well worth the investment. This is Greg Stoddard, KF9MP, reporting for This Week in Amateur Radio. The Amateur Radio Pedestrian Mobile Handbook by Edward Brenizer, Whiskey Alpha 3 Whiskey Sierra Juliet, is now available for download as a PDF. The purpose of this handbook is to provide the amateur radio operator who is interested in operating pedestrian mobile with the information needed to get on the airwaves. Hopefully, with this information, the average amateur radio operator will have enough knowledge to build and operate a pedestrian mobile amateur radio station. 
It is Edward's hope that his handbook will guide the amateur radio operator who would like to try pedestrian mobile to a point where he or she can build a pedestrian mobile station and get outdoors to operate that station. If this handbook adds one additional pedestrian mobile operator to our ranks, it has fulfilled its purpose, said Edward. You can download the handbook PDF from whiskey3bravoquebeccharlie.homestead.com. Here's this week's listing of upcoming ARRL Learning Network webinars, a members-only benefit. To register, check out upcoming webinars, and to view previously recorded sessions, please visit the ARRL Learning Network webinar page. ARRL members may register for upcoming presentations and view previously recorded Learning Network webinars. ARRL affiliated radio clubs may also use the recordings as presentations for club meetings, mentoring new and current hams, and discussing amateur radio topics. Working the Pile Up, presented by Ron Delpierre Smith, KD9 IPO, will be presented on Tuesday, October 5th, 2021, at 1 p.m. Eastern. That's 1700 UTC. Ron Delpierre Smith, KD9 IPO, Vice President of the Chicago Suburban Radio Association and an ARRL assistant section manager in Illinois will offer an enlightening discussion on working a pileup from both sides of the contact. Whether your interest lies in ARRL field day, contesting, special events, or rare DX, this is a must-see presentation. Rod will discuss search and pounce and running techniques, when to use them, and some tips on working them to your advantage. The ARRL Learning Network schedule is subject to change. If you're looking for contacts with stations in the Oceania region, and you happen to be a YL, you're in luck. The Oceania DX Contest is taking place on two consecutive weekends, October 2nd and 3rd for phone, and October 9th and 10th for CW. And this year, the spotlight includes the two awards introduced specifically for YLs. Both awards, sponsored by the Australian Ladies Amateur Radio Association, are being given to a single operator, young lady, YL, who achieved the highest combined score in phone and CW. YLs inside the Oceania region are eligible for the Florence McKenzie Award, named for Australia's first known licensed female ham radio operator, who received the call sign A2GA in 1925. YLs in the rest of the world are eligible for the Austin Henry Award, named for a prize-winning home brewer, who is a member of the YASME Foundation, the RSGB, the Society of New Zealand Amateur Radio Transmitters, and the ARRL. She became Australia's third licensed YL in 1930 when she received the call sign VK3YL. YLs who want to be considered for either award should select the YL box on their entry form when they submit their logs. Meanwhile, the Bendigo Amateur Radio and Electronics Club is inviting you all to Australia. The occasion is the startup of the club's Special Interest Group Session, or SIGS. The first one is set for Friday, September 17th at 7.30 p.m. local time. The location is the club headquarters in Bendigo East Hall in Bendigo. But don't let the small obstacle of an ocean or two prevent you from being a part of it all. The club is opening the session to attendees everywhere via Zoom, and every radio club is encouraged to participate. According to an email from Graham Knight, VK3GRK, these sessions are being held on weekends at the Bendigo Amateur Radio and Electronic Club headquarters and will cover a variety of topics led by club members with expertise in those areas. They'll cover such topics as CW, JS8 call, Winlink, mentoring, and a basic introduction to amateur radio. Plans for the Helvetia Telegraphy Clubs and big next big activation are up in the air. In fact, the radio operators hope to get up in the air and stay there for at least two hours aboard a hot air balloon. Their scheduled launch date is the 14th of September, when they hope to start operating sometime after 0530 UTC. The call sign Hotel Bravo 9 Hotel Charlie slash AM will be activated by members of the USKA Slant Bar HTC National Mountain Day Commission as hams ascend to the sky over Switzerland, operating all the while on 40, 30, and 20 meters. They will be transmitting with 15 watts of CW power, making use of vertical dangling antennas. If you are interested in a contact, watch the reverse beacon network or the DX clusters. You can also use APRS if you're interested in tracking the balloon's exact position. Are the radio operator's hopes a bit overinflated? 
Probably not. They're already advising everyone to get familiar with such important Q codes as QAH for altitude and QAL for landing. Many of the news and information items heard on This Week in Amateur Radio have been provided by the American Radio Relay League, the ARRL Letter, the ARRL Audio News, the Southgate Amateur Radio News Service, Southgate Vibes, AMSAT, the Radio Amateurs of Canada, the FCC, the Radio Society of Great Britain and Ofcom, the SARL, the International Amateur Radio Union, the Wireless Institute of Australia, the Amateur Radio Newsline, the International Telecommunications Union, and various news sources on the Internet. This Week in Amateur Radio is heard around the world on the Internet, on low-power FM stations, and on great repeater systems like the WB3GXW repeater on 147.225 MHz in Silver Springs, Maryland, serving all of Silver Springs and also covering the nation's capital, Washington, D.C., WB3GXW can also be found on Echolink Conference Server Node 6154. If you are a This Week in Amateur Radio affiliate and you would like us to give a free on-air announcement of your station's carriage of the program, please send us an email with the station location, call sign, coverage area, and day and time you air This Week in Amateur Radio, plus any other information you would like us to impart. You can send to the following email, w 2 xbs 77 at gmail.com. That address once again is w2xbs77 at gmail.com. This Week in Amateur Radio is produced by Community Video Associates Incorporated. Now for the staff of This Week in Amateur Radio, this is Jeff Rahner, WB2AEQ, saying 73 until next week.